Awesome. Thank you. Welcome and thank you for joining us for Now What? Navigating the Faculty Position Offer Process presented by Don Braithway, Willa Cath Cather, Professor Ertimit, Ermitus for the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Dr. Braithway studies how people in personal and family relationships communicate and family relationships communicate and navigate family change and challenges. Her research centers on communication and understudied and changing family communication rituals and dialectics of related, of relating, especially in step families among voluntary fictive kin. Dr. Braithwaite has offered applications and is co-author or co-editor of six books, including Family Communication, Cohesion and Change, Engaging Theories in Interpersonal Communication, and Engaging Theories in Family Communication. She writes a blog, Communication Matters for Psychology Today. Dr. Braithwaite is a past president. And Dr. Braithwaite is a past president and a distinguished scholar of NCA. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Br Don Braithwaite presenting Now What? Navigating the Faculty Position Offer Process. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. And I'm going to give you a full disclosure. I just found out that my husband had home for Lincoln, but I was talking to you guys. And, uh, and I'm so glad I could fit it in. So if I look, I'm not as dressed up as I normally am. Not that I ever look all that great, but um, I guess for what's going on, I probably look as, you, this is all you get. Anyway, I'm delighted to be here. And, and this is such a great time. Now I will tell you, Jacqueline Marsh here was one of my graduate students. We would do at Nebraska uh, professional developments on job searching is one of the things we do. And you know, we always tried to be really encouraging. But, it, but invariably, one or two graduate students would be in the back of the room crying, and we'd feel so terrible. Uh, because all, we'd feel so terrible uh, because all of our students get jobs, and I believe that you will do really well too. So I have the happy uh, ability to talk to you about about uh, what do you do when you get a job offer, and I'll try to keep it uh, short enough that we you know leave at least ten minutes for some questions. And, uh, and well, you've got my. Uh, on the handout I've given you, which is a handout that my husband Chuck Braithwaite and I wrote, um, you can see where, how to find me at the University of Nebraska. So even though I'm retired, I email. And if you have any questions for me, don't hesitate to follow up, okay? So this is the happy thing, right? You go out and you, this is the happy thing, right? You go out and you do these interviews, for whether, and of course I'm talking mostly about academic jobs. Um, although I don't know that things maybe are completely different. Hi. Um, when, um, but, but obviously, you know, that's the kind of jobs I'm talking about. And I know that it can be stressful. What are general guidelines about the behind the scenes? I was a department, a graduate director for 13 years and a department chair for nine. So especially from the department chair seat, I, I have, you know, good information and strong feelings about how all of this works. But I just want to start by saying it works kind of different everywhere. Right? And just what I think works kind of different everywhere. Right? And just what I think I've seen it all with, for my students, somebody will come back and I'll say, well, that's one I haven't seen before. So, you know, that's, you'll just have to kind of hang tough and um, roll with your punches a little bit. Um, the, I, the most important thing I would say to you as you're going through the job process, well, I mean, you don't have to, but it would be smart to. And that might be your advisor. That might be another faculty member too. It might be your master's advisor. It could be me. Um, you know, it, you just do need, things happen, and it's so hard from your seat to interpret it. So don't get your mentors lined up and let them interpret it. So don't get your mentors lined up and let them know what you're doing, and get them on speed dial and call them, you know. And all of us are kind of nerds about this. We're happy when people get job offers, and we want to help you negotiate that. The other thing I want to say is there is a very big rumor mill out there. NCA exists. There was a blog, or I would, would have, it was a lift serve, a wiki page, and students were keeping track of the jobs. And we would get information at Nebraska saying, people are saying your job is filled. People, it says, you know, they're interviewed. Sometimes that information is right, and sometimes it's not right. So, you know, always, and sometimes it's not right. So, you know, always trust 
the, the, you really got to develop it. If you get a job offer, especially, you're developing a relationship with the person who's going to be your department chair, people who are going to be your colleagues. So it's fine to get all the information you can, trade information with each other, but just real there. And we would kind of, I mean, we weren't laughing at the candidates. We would just start laughing like, oh my God, we've hardly started looking at files and they've acted like, you know. So that's just what I wanted to say about that. Your job interview process and getting ready for a job offer starts the day you apply. Getting ready for a job offer starts the day you apply. It starts when you do the short list interview, if you do one on Zoom. It's, it certainly starts when you go to campus. So I've given you lots of questions on this handout that if you were to get an academic job uh, interview or, or offer, either for a tenure lecturer position or sometimes called clinical faculty, faculty or professor of practice, all those jobs are slightly different. But when it comes to the job of the job offer, <laughs> these things are so hot, it's heating my water up. Um, uh, just you start you really are going to start this so you want if the day you get a job offer these are the questions start this so you want if the day you get a job offer these are the questions you want answers to but when you go on your job interview you're going to hear a lot of information and and I know from doing job interviews it's very tiring and stressful and kind of fun if you like meeting people uh, I always enjoyed I met the most wonderful people on job interviews the job that I had to turn down the two people it was Sandra Metz and Bill Kupek at Illinois State uh, when I was coming out of school they offered me a job I ended up not being able to take it and they became great friends so if you navigate this process well whether you get the job or whether you um, just get to get out there and get experienced by several people I met on job interviews. So, so good things can happen whether you get the job or not. I realize you want the job, but I just wanted to say that. Um, so when, you, when you go out and interview, sometimes they'll tell you a little bit about, they may say we have three candidates and you're the second one in, or they may say we have three candidates and you're the second one in, or we're finishing interviewing whenever. And just everything they tell you, take notes, like on all these questions that I gave you. Just keep taking notes, you know. Excuse yourself, you have to go to the bathroom and take notes, take notes, take notes. Uh, so that you, because you're just not going to remember all this stuff, and you're going to use it two days, or two and a half days plus travel. So you're just going to be so much more tired than you think. And they're going to keep you going, they're going to take you to meals, you'll, you'll not have eaten so much in your life. Don't order messy food like ribs and things, and you'll be okay. Once that you leave and all the candidates leave, the committee at the university has, once that you leave and all the candidates leave, the committee at the university has to meet. And then they kind of have to go through a process. At my university, you know, we would decide who our top, we would usually rank the candidates in the order we would like to make the offers. And then that decision had to be run through our dean's office, so we had to wait for them. And so I'm up through human resources at the university. And, and so you just never know how many people. There are a few handouts up here. And if you don't get one, send me an email at Nebraska. In fact, by the way, send me an email anyway. Uh, if, are they still there? I don't know where the person is. There's one. Here's another one. Here's here's one. I don't know where the person is. There's one. Here's another one. Here's here's one. Um, I I will also send you all the notes that I'm speaking about today too. So just send me an email. Um, if you could give me a couple days, that would be great. So this process before they can even we can make an offer can take one day, two days, three days, a week, or even home going. Oh my gosh, what's happening? I would just say though, stay by the phone. Well, you have mobile phones. Keep your phone with you and, and keep paper and pen with you because they could call you any time. You know, you could be walking back from class. You could be in the bathroom. You could be at lunch. And that department chair is going to try to call you. Could be at lunch. And that department chair is going to try to call you. Uh, and they usually will call. It's a call you want to take, if at all possible. If you can't talk to the long, if, you know, if they call, I mean, they may be calling to say they finished the search. A lot of times, if you weren't the candidate, you'll probably get an email. Um, nobody likes to deliver that on the phone. So, but if that person calls, most likely they're going to tell you either this is taking longer than we thought, hang in there. If they say hang in there, they're calling you personally. That's a pretty good sign, but you still don't know. And usually so much of this is out of the department chair's control. Uh, I would just say show enthusiasm. Now, uh, I would just say show enthusiasm. 
Now, if you went out to this school and you ended up really not liking it and you don't think it's the place for you, um, and you could, I think, then let that chair know. If you would not accept a job offer, don't put them through arguing for you and having meetings. That happens, because you're not there. We're looking at just not your cup of tea politely. You can even do it through email to email the department chair, thank them profusely for their time and the honor of coming, and dive out. But, but chances are you want to get the job offer. So show enthusiasm. You know, even if you're not sure if you're going to take it, um, let them know if they, even if you're not sure if you're going to take it, um, let them know if there's anything else going on. For example, if you have another interview you're leaving for soon, and I'll talk about the timeline really soon. Ask a lot of questions and just write, 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 write. And then if you need to, you can perception check. So they're usually going to tell you the status and you would start on this date and here's the salary we could offer. At that point, I wouldn't negotiate anything. I would just act like this is the greatest offer you ever got and you're delighted and you should be delighted and proud of yourself whether you decide to go or not. The other thing smart department chairs will do is when you're at the interview, by the way, when you go to the interview, what would you need? What, do you need a computer? I imagine you do. Do you need, uh, what, what do you, you know, have a list of what you need and be as specific as possible about that. Sometimes they can meet that, and that could be things like, um, you know, you could ask about, do new faculty ever get a, a course release that might need, um, what kinds of things you're going to be working on. And then if you have any other contingencies, and the big one is if you have an academic partner. And, and um, you know, hopefully if a chair's smart, they'll ask you about those things. So I always ask candidates in the last meeting, is there anything else I should know? Is there anything else I should know if, we're, if we were able to make you an offer? If you get asked that, my advice, you will get different advice on this if you're partners. I would answer that question honestly and have your partners veto and give that to that chair. I had a candidate one time where I asked that question and they did the same offer and they accepted the offer. This was quite a lot, many, many years ago. And then, then they called me up and said, by the way, I have a partner. <laughs> Once I've made that offer and I've negotiated with my dean's office, I'm, I can't, I'm, I'm not, I, it's the only time I can really do things for you. And that's the same thing to, if we can do things for you. And that's the same thing to, if we can do anything for you. And that's the same thing with equipment. So it's not like if you ask for a computer and an iPad, we're gonna rescind the offer. You know, so be reasonable. You can only get so much, and your mentor should be able to help you. But this is a department chair. This is the last t time I can really hate at that point is awful. Does that make sense? Okay. So start prepping that when you, you know, start thinking about that. The timeline for a decision is something you need to ask about. Now, when you applied to graduate school, how long did you have to make a decision? Do you remember when you applied for your PhDs? Do you remember when you applied for your PhDs? When, was it, when were those due? Well, yeah, probably months. I mean, a lot, it wasn't due till April 15th that a lot of you might have gotten offers in January or February, right? On the job market, you probably have five to seven days. So it's a little different. And that period drove me nuts. And in a way, I think it's a disservice to students because I always felt like, gosh, this, this, you're not going to have two months or three months to make a decision. They're probably, I mean, every job is different, but most of the time they're gonna ask for a decision in about five to seven days. And that's a really big decision, right? And wanna think about that place, physical place, that job. Is this a job that I would take? What would it take to get me there? You know, uh, usually they won't ask you too much about salary, but if you're going to a public institution, those salaries are public. Excuse yourself and try to go to the library. There's a budget book, in it that, or, or sometimes it's even the book, in it that, or, or sometimes it's even the local newspaper. Like the University of Iowa, Iowa City pr prints every faculty member's salary once a year. It's horrible, actually. So there, that information is sometimes out there, and you can kind of know what people are making in the department, etc. Um, on this list that I gave you, or if you don't have one, that I'll be happy. It's just got lots of questions about. Promotion, you know, how, are, how am I evaluated every year? Um, what are the expectations here? You're always going to want them to be really specific and say, two publications a year. But smart chairs aren't going to do that. Not to be tricky, but it's just so different for different people. And it's different in different universities. And it's different in different universities. 
so they might give you a range, but they're not trying to be cagey. It's just, you know, if you're a qualitative scholar, a rhetorical scholar, a quantitative scholar, and the kinds of journals and the kind of work you do, um, you know, ask them, quiz them, try to get the best look. I assume you already know that when you, before you, you, when I first started doing this, you know, there was no internet. So you can get so much information by going online. You should study the CVs of all the faculty members of the department. Figure out who the associate professors are. You can usually see on their CV when they came. So you know if, they, if they're in year six or seven, they've just, year six or seven, they've just come up for tenure. So see what the last tenured people did, right? And you could say, I was looking at Professor, you know, uh, Gonzalez's Vita, and, um, you, know, I, I, you know, is his something, would that be a good model for me? So those are the kinds of things that you want to ask, ask, ask a lot of questions. You can follow up and ask the chair to meet with you again. You can follow up on email with questions. Usually, usually for most of the most of you will be dealing with department chairs. Sometimes the deans, especially in smaller universities, you may be talking to the dean. Sometimes there's a chair of the search committee, but that's usually committee, but that's usually not the, the decision making person. But find out. So whoever calls you, are you the person that I would ask and talk to? You can negotiate a little bit. Um, if sometimes, though, a chair will say to you, um, this is the salary we're offering, and I just want to let you know it's not. I guess if he says or she says that, you kind of need to take that person at their word. If you come back to negotiate a little bit, you might say, I just wanted to talk about salary a little bit. Is, is it possibly negotiable? Um, often salaries are negotiable, but are negotiable, but... I hate to tell you it's not $10,000 worth. It might be a thousand or two. And I often left a little bit of money back in the account. And, um, and, I, and it's pretty funny because I hired somebody one time who did no negotiating at all. And I said, would you like me to ask me for, would you like to ask me for another thousand dollars? Oh yeah, and I said, well good, because I'm ready to give it to you. So you know, you can negotiate that equipment. Sometimes you can negotiate a, a, a course release that first semester. But it kind of asks that chair, sometimes you get some research assistance, sometimes there's some summer startup money. And, and chairs have a lot, if, if, I offer you sal if I offer you salary, you know it's exponential, right? If you start at $65,000 or whatever it is, every year your raise is based on that. So, so universities sometimes would rather give you one-time monies, like a little bit more travel money the first year or a course release, it's kind of free, it doesn't really cost them anything, or you know, even a little bit more equipment. So if salary isn't negotiable, you can kind of think about, well, what are some other things that would help you to be successful, okay? Um, and so I realize I'm giving you some changes because everywhere is so different. You've got to, from my perspective, I always trusted that department chair, and I, fig chair, and I figured if I couldn't trust them now, would I really want to work with that person? And department chairs turn over. So you might happen on my first two jobs is I worked with one department chair, and by the time I came in the fall, there was a new person. And that happens. Uh, but, but I always had schools honor things. So this negotiation thing is tough. But I get calls from former graduate students all the time, and graduate students in my program, and graduate students from other places who know me, and just said, can I talk this off or through with you? I'm talking through with somebody. I wish that I had done that. When I came out, I was just so grateful to have a job. Like, oh, thank anything. No, what I could do. And I didn't, at the time, have the kind of mentors that I think most of you have today. Um, let's see what else here. So that timeline is quick. If you have another, again, if you have another interview lined up, you can talk to them about that. And if you get the offer you want, for you want, just take it, be done with it, and be happy. But if you're not sure and you think you want to do the other interview, talk to that chair about it. Now, if you say to that chair, um, I have another interview in two, three weeks, I might say, I'm just so sorry, but we really can't wait that long. Because we're not going to want to lose the other candidates. We want you to come if, you to come if we offered you a job. And I will tell you the other thing. You may come to realize that you are not the first offer. And at the time, that feels kind of crummy. But you know what? If you've got a job, and you, you're not going to care after a while. And that may be another reason why the process takes longer. If we make an offer to Jacqueline, 
and we go through this, you know, one or two weeks till I can do it, and then a negotiation process with her and give her seven days, and maybe she talks me into a few more days. Well, you're sitting there for three weeks or a month going, oh my gosh, what's going on? It's terrible, I know, and we get that. Um, you could always write the chair and ask what's, go ask what's going on. And, and ask them, you know, just say, can you give me an, any idea how things are going? How, what's your timeline? If you do get another offer somewhere, let the chair know. And if you've got another offer when the chair calls to make you the offer, I would let the chair know. First of all, it's going to make them try a little harder to get you. Psychologically, everybody wants what everybody else has got, right? I mean, there's lots of studies that say that. You don't have to be real braggy about it, but you say, well, I do have another offer I'm considering. And, and then again, talk to them about their timeline. So, so uh, you may have to decide. A lot of times, you get caught between a rock and a hard between a rock and a hard place. You know, what do you do if you get a job offer from me today, and two weeks from now, you know you've got your your dream interview coming up? You may just have to roll your dice and just take a chance and hope that the dreamers come get you. Um, and, and so sometimes, you know, it's, it's just, you don't get to collect your four job offers and sit and think about them for a month is what I'm telling you. So it puts a little bit of pressure on you, and frankly, it puts pressure on the department too, and that's the way that that, that whole situation goes. So it's kind of complicated. Um, one other quick thing I would say, if you're, I would say, I would say to me, if you are, um, going on the job market and you've already got a job, I think the best thing to do is to talk to your department chair. You don't have to tell the whole faculty and you can even, I've had faculty say, you know, I, I'm testing the waters and here's why, this is near my family, I'm not unhappy here, and not happy there, they don't need to tell me that. And, um, and, and I'm going to say, I love you and I want the best for you and thank you for letting me know. And then they might say, could you not tell the other faculty and graduate students right now? I don't want to get everybody upset. And I just always kept that information to myself. But the thing is, if you don't tell your department chair, very small discipline, if you figure this out, do you see everybody hugging around here? Everybody knows everybody. These things do not stay secret. So I think it's better, as a department chair, I would feel really crummy if you were on my faculty and I found out that you had an interview next week at the University of Oklahoma or something. I wouldn't be unhappy for you, but I would, I would uh, make sure, or, and if you don't trust your chair, maybe at least let one senior faculty member in your department who's been in your corner know what's going on. And I think that's just the better thing to do. A couple other things I'll say and then I'll take some, certainly be happy to take some questions. One. If you take a job offer, if you take a job offer from somebody, I believe it is completely unethical to, to, to go back on that commitment. I think that's true if you accept a doctoral program too. Um, I mean, you, my university gets to hire maybe every three or four years. It's such a precious commodity. Nebraska is a little worse that way places that hire all the time. But, but you know, they just spend a lot of money and time on you, and you spend it too. We recognize that. So take, when you accept that offer, I believe that you're accepting it. The other thing I should have said is, that what's very confusing about this process is when you actually get a letter of offer. Most of the time this whole offer, most of the time this whole process is verbal while you're negotiating. And it may take a little bit longer to get your letter. That's, I've always just trusted the process. And I wouldn't get quite as whipped up about the letter. I mean, you want to get it, right? And you want to read it very carefully. But in some places, they'll send you a letter right away. In other places, the very last thing you get. That doesn't mean you don't have a job. Does that make sense? Last thing, and I'll shut up. Treat people well, because you never know who you're meeting. First of all, you could be meeting like your new husband or your wife or something. You just never know. You could be meeting friends in the discipline. You could be interdiscipline. You could be interviewing with a journal editor who's going to be looking at your work. So be nice, you know. This is hard for them. We know it's hard for you. Um, and, and just take it as an opportunity to get to know people, to get some great experience when you go out to interview. Um, and, and just be, you know, nice. And if you're nervous, question, go to that chair and ask them and just say, gosh, this process is making me really nervous. We understand that you can talk to us about that. And you can ask us the best way to navigate this process. What do I do? You know, I've got this other interview. What's your advice? What do I do now? And like I said, if you can't trust that chair, you don't want to work for them anyway. 
I want to work for them anyway. So um, I know that's a lot of information. It all sounds really scary, and it just works out. But the best thing is, I got the best lecture of all. You've got a job offer, and, and then you just want to negotiate that process in the very best way you can. Does that help? Questions? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, things are uncertain. They're always uncertain in higher ed. So, and my always uncertain in higher ed. So, in my time in Nebraska, we had some searches shut down for budget. You know, we once we'd already brought in candidates. I made a job offer on the way to NCA a few years ago, and then the whole process got shut down. I was able to come back and got it reo. I worked really hard. We got it reopened, and I hired the person I wanted to hire. Luckily, this person wasn't a student. He already had a job. But yeah, I mean, it's hard. You could read the local newspapers and try to get a sense of it, but it's just kind of wild times. You know, everybody's got budget contingencies. But actually, this year, I think the, you know, the job market sucked for the last two years with COVID, but it's a fair amount of jobs out there, and I think that it's going to stay rather healthy. Um, I don't know that any department's going to get back to, if they had 30 faculty, they're probably down five or six in COVID, and I think they're going to get two back or three, uh, if they're lucky. Oh, no, usually, usually, yeah, usually the dean's office, in our case, the dean's office gives us a salary range for the job. And it may be very narrow, it may be kind of wide. And so usually one, so it's probably a little harder to get equipment, you know, it's a little harder. But usually once they commit to you, they've, they've, they've set the dollars aside. So, you know, but, but I mean, searches do get paused. And usually it has nothing to do with you or the candidates, it's just, um, you know, and right now, it's. I think there's a department that's paused the search. It's, I think there's a department that's paused the search. I have a feeling there's some people who got COVID, and that's happening too. And that you know, you might get COVID. I mean, that's one of the problems. There's just weird things out there that are slowing things down. But yeah, no, I think that's a good question. But I, I wouldn't worry about that so much. Um, Can you say it nice and loud? So I'm an international student. Yeah. So at what point of your job offer or job? I think you should let probably it's if it there it, do you kind of mark something on your resume about your some kind of mark something on your resume about your some institutions ask you to mark yeah. like are you an Yeah, I would just make sure that that department chair knows that you're an international student and that they'll know that you have to deal with some of these issues if you're going to come in. I, in, just as a chair, so I would have had to go out. If, you had, if we were inviting you for an interview, my job would be to go out and get prepared to, to, to handle that. And so that's the chair's job. But yes, you should let them know. Again, it so helps that chair to know what they're dealing with. It doesn't mean if you've got a partner or you're an international student. It doesn't mean if you've got a partner or you're an international student that it will make us any less likely to go for it. But help that person to help you, I think. So I would tell them before you come in, or at least when you're there. It's usually probably kind of obvious sometimes. But, but yeah, I would just let that department chair know. Well, he said, are there any red flags that might give you some... Hopefully you've seen the red flags when you go to interview. I always tell people to watch. I spent every minute the faculty would spend with me, every meal, every drinks, whatever they would do, and I would watch them together. Are they laughing at each other's jokes? Do And I would watch them together. Are they laughing at each other's jokes? You can tell sometimes who the people are who are, I hate to say it, kind of a pain in the ass, and you see people rolling their eyes. And that happens, every faculty, you know, academics are weird anyway, right? You're always going to have some guys like, well, often guys, I hate to say this, but no, you're going to have, um, I think the other red flag might be the chair. Sometimes chairs, you might be on the job market, the, the chair's first year. And they truly, this is a very complicated process, and they may not know what they're doing. And 
if that's true, I mean, you might just want to think, you might hear that that person's in, and I had, my first job offer was with, you might hear that that person's in, and I had, my first job offer was with an interim chair, and this person was clueless about what they were doing. And I didn't hold that against the department. And so I tried to think about when things went wrong, would people, I mean, one place they brought us in, my husband and I came in together, they put us in a hotel out on the highway and said, it's not what they should be doing. But, you know, not everybody just understands the social etiquette. So, so yeah, pay attention to the nonverbals and the verbals. And, and again, if people are saying nasty things about each other, people can pretty, the more you talk and spend time with them, and the more that they're tired and everything, you can learn spend time with them. And the more that they're tired and everything, you can learn a lot. Um, so just, I took lots of notes that I really watched. But I, I'm a personal relationship scholar, so I really watched and tried to get a sense, did they like each other? They seemed to like to be in the same room together. I mean, anything you negotiated, like salary and equipment and startup, is going to be in your letters. None of that's going to change. But yeah, you know, if, if chairs, that's probably not going to go into the letter. And if you find out that that person's going to be the chair, not going to be the chair, you might say, do you, do you guys know who's going to be the chair yet? I wonder if I could chat with that person. But, you know, if you come in, uh, you've got to have a little faith in the system. But the system can let you down. So, you know, I would take lots of notes and have that all written. The system can let you down. So, you know, I would take lots of notes and have that all written down for yourself. And then as you kind of get close to the semester over the summer, write that new chair, congratulate. I, congr I hear you the chair. Condolences or congratulations. And um, you just, I had been working with Dr. Gonzalez, and here's what he said. Um, or here's what that person said to you. A good chair will have already asked those questions and know, but well, they're new. They kind of don't know what, I mean, it could three years from now, it could be you, you know. So, I mean, it's, it's a big learning. Being a chair is a steep learning curve. Yeah. Do you have other questions? Yeah. Um, you kind of mentioned. Let me know when I have other questions. Yeah. Um, you kind of mentioned. Let me know when I have to stop, stop. You get a break, or is there one more thing after mine? Okay, she's going to make me stop, so. Okay, you mentioned um, kind of telling schools about other offers you were getting or other interviews you have. How specific should you be? Like, you don't have to. You could just say, I have another interview lined up. I'd really like, I, I know you've made me an offer. I'm delighted about that. I would like to go on this interview. Sometimes they'll ask you who it is because they're kind of curious. They shouldn't. It's not really a legal question because it's not a bona fide occupational qualification question because it's not a bona fide occupational qualification question. But they might ask you. And if you feel comfortable, you can tell them. But you don't need to. And I probably would tell them not very much. You know, and if you have an offer, let them know. Uh, I do have an offer from another school I'm considering, and you know, and just yeah, just I think it's to be honest. They need to know what they're facing as much.